In this video we're going to deal with monetarism and later on we're going to look at Fisher's equation of exchange. Now these in fact are the subject matter of other videos on the course but this is um, a reminder of the type of material that we encounter when we deal with monetarism. So first of all let's start with simply two axes and put the rate of inflation on the vertical and the unemployment level on the horizontal. Now this was the masterstroke of A.W. Phillips in 1957 and what he did was simply just draw a scatter diagram. He looked at the UK economy, he excluded the war years and between about 1865 to 1956 or thereabouts he um, he plotted for each year what was the average rate of inflation and the average unemployment figures. Bearing in mind of course that these figures were notoriously inaccurate in the early years. But nonetheless, just just do it and see what happens. So he plotted a whole series. I've only plotted a few here as you can see. And each X would represent a particular year. So for 1931 on the bottom right we see an X and there was a very low rate of inflation in that year and a high rate of or a high level of unemployment. So it's quite a straightforward scatter diagram. And then he did something particularly clever. He fitted a line of best fit, but he didn't fit a straight line like we ordinarily do with regression analysis. He he fitted a curve of best fit and found this curve which then became known, unsurprisingly enough, as the Phillips curve. And the point where inflation is equal to zero, we term the natural rate of unemployment. In fact, there are various definitions of the natural rate of unemployment, and we'll encounter some others in different classes, or another one in a different class. But for the moment, we'll just say that's the rate of inflation at which, sorry, that's the level of unemployment at which there is no inflation. So we'll just call it the natural rate of unemployment. And this became known as the Phillips curve. Now in itself, it doesn't look very impressive. In fact, this was a revolution because up to this point, governments believed that they could control inflation, control unemployment, control the balance of payments, uh, bring about high rates of economic growth and also have some sort of distribution policy uh, enabling uh, the poorer families to have some sort of payments as well, a welfare system. And these were written down in a, a by a committee called the Radcliffe Committee. So these were the, the targets of economic policy, low rates of inflation, um, low rates of unemployment, well you can see immediately that's not possible. We can't have low rates of inflation and low levels of unemployment according to the Phillips curve. Just it's never happened and therefore it's not something that can be done. Now in addition to this there were other problems. So not only could the targets of economic policy not be met according to the Radcliffe Committee and don't forget at this time Keynesian economics had been developed in 1936 by John Maynard Keynes and had become very influential after the Second World War after 1945. So now there was a belief under Keynesianism that it was only a question of pulling the right levers and pressing the right buttons in a sense being able to adjust fiscal policy or monetary policy or exchange rate policy and that would bring about the solution. But what the Phillips curve was saying was no matter what you could do, no matter what, what happens, uh, we can't have low inflation and low unemployment. There is a trade-off. In fact, according to monetarist economists, it's far worse than this because the Phillips curve is not a trade-off. It's not the blue curve line we've got here. In fact, it's the vertical red line. Because 
if the government attempts to reduce unemployment below the natural rate then uh, inflation will start to rise I'll just put the cursor onto the screen for a moment uh, say the government tried to reduce unemployment to this level here well as you can see there is inflation well in that case the trade unions would now negotiate for a pay rise plus an adjustment to cover the rate of inflation so let's say the rate of inflation here was four percent just for argument's sake now let's that means that the trade unions might negotiate for uh, four percent for themselves plus four percent to cover the rate of inflation so they would negotiate for eight percent now in this case there would be some trouble uh, industrial disputes and strikes and lockouts and so on and they might settle for six percent in the end but as you can see six percent is not on the curve so six percent is above the curve it's up here somewhere in other words the rate of inflation will start to accelerate and that's why the curve is vertical so it's inflationary expectations that is the problem that's what can bring about the vertical Phillips curve workers integrate or incorporate their expected rate of inflation into their pay negotiations and then of course if the government tries to uh, maintain that level of unemployment by let's say increasing the money supply then we would have a vertical Phillips curve so according to the monetarist there isn't a trade-off the, the Phillips relationship worked at a time when workers did not negotiate in what's called real terms workers did not take the rate of inflation into account when negotiating pay claims workers at that time negotiated in what's known as nominal terms they negotiated for pounds and pence they negotiated for money they didn't make reference to prices it's what Keynes called money illusion the workers suffered from money illusion but once the workers had got over the money illusion once the workers had worked out the relationship between uh, inflation and the purchasing power of their incomes then the workers negotiated in percentages they negotiated in real terms they compared their percentage increase to the rate of inflation and they knew how well off they were but once that happened the Phillips curve became vertical so there was no trade-off that meant the economy would move to the natural rate of unemployment and stay there now the only way it would reduce is if productivity increased or there was more investment in the economy so more workers were required uh, perhaps more technology more innovation and perhaps greater training more workers required so it may reduce but all in all the Phillips curve became a vertical relationship now the monetarists well this group of economists believe that the UK economy uh, should move to the natural rate of unemployment in other words it should move to the natural rate and stay there because if the government attempts to reduce unemployment it to try to reduce unemployment below the natural rate then inflation will start to accelerate so it's best to be at the natural rate where inflation is at zero market forces should be allowed to work according to this group um, and that the the government should not intervene to manage the economy the government should stay out of it it should be market forces that controls the economy that's their view and inflation should be controlled through the control of the money supply that is the the only role for government in this scenario 
the government should not attempt to influence markets or adjust markets. Uh, it should not help companies if they get into trouble. The company should go bankrupt. Um, it should not uh, redistribute in favour of the less paid, the less well off. Um, it should be market forces. Uh, people should acquire skills and sell their skills at a higher price. So everything would be governed by market forces. The only role for the government would be to control inflation by the control of the money supply. Now this leads us to the quantity theory of money. Now this theory postulates a simple but positive proportional and proportional rep um, relationship between the supply of money and the price level. So it postulates a very simple but positive and proportional relationship between the supply of money and the price level. It was put forward by Irving Fisher in 1911. Now this states that MV equals PT. That's the Fisher equation. So it looks simple enough. M is the money supply. V is known as the velocity of circulation of money. P is an index of all prices. That means raw materials, semi-completed goods, work in progress, final goods. P is all prices, an index of all prices. And T is the total number of transactions in the economy in a given time period. So we've got four, four variables here and we have MV equals PT. Now let's look at these in a little more detail. We'll start with M. The problem here is which definition of money should be used. Uh, notes and coins in circulation is known as narrow money. Maybe that's the definition that should be used. That's what we mean by the money supply. But the money supply is a very vague concept. Nowadays we have credit cards and debit cards and sometimes we pay for items using debit cards and credit cards. So should the definition uh, include bank credit which is known as wide money? Should it include money or the capacity of banks to make money? So big difference here. Which one should the government target? There are several different definitions of money. Which one is correct for the Fisher equation? That's the problem. I've only just this two, but there are others. There's, there's one uh, which incorporates money held overseas. Um, so there are various definitions. And there is a problem about selecting which M we fit into the equation. Now V is the velocity of circulation of money. This is the number of times a unit of currency is used to transact in a given time period. The number of times we use a unit of currency to transact in a given time period. If we use a five pound note and we use it twice every day, it acts like a ten pound note. It's performed two transactions well, 5 times 2 is 10. So it's the same as one £10 note going around once, or five, one five, sorry, a £5 note going around twice. One £10 note going around once, or a £5 note going around twice, does the same job. So, person X spends £5 on petrol. The person in the petrol station takes the £5 and buys fish and chips. So the five pounds has acted like ten pounds. It's done the same job as ten pounds. In this case, the velocity of circulation is two. It's done two transactions. The five pound note went from person X to the petrol station, and then it went from the petrol station to the fish and chip shop. So it has a velocity of circulation of two. The Keynesians considered V to be a variable. For example, in the festive season, money circulates 
circulates faster than in February. And over the, the period of a year, the velocity of circulation of money increases at some times. It goes up, for example, in the summer, it falls off in the autumn, and then it goes up again around Christmas time in the new year, falls off after the new year, after the new year sales, um, becomes very small, and then it, it picks up again um, uh, towards the summertime. So V is a variable according to the, to the Keynesians. Monetarists, however, consider V to be a constant. Um, monetarism is a long-run theory, whereas Keynesianism is short-run. And that's the difference. Um, if we consider V over, a, uh, say, a one-year period, how it varies over the year, well, if we take an average of that, that would be the monetarist value for V. It would be a constant, uh, a single average figure. So th the monetarists would take a very long-run view, look at all of the ups and downs in V due to seasonal factors and sales and slumps and so on, but would average it out. So in the for the monetarist, it's, it's a constant. Now, P for the price level. In the Fisher equation, P refers to an index of all prices. That means intermediate goods as well as final goods. So, particularly, we're, we're interested in particular in the, uh, the final goods. That's what we go out to buy. We're not very interested in the intermediate goods that make up the products. We're interested in the final goods. So, that may be seen as a limitation of the Fisher equation. Now lastly, the number of transactions. Well, the monetarists assume this to be constant, T. Um, the Keynesians consider transactions to be constant uh, only at full employment. So the monetarists assume it to be constant because they assume the economy will be at the natural rate of unemployment. Because if the government tries to reduce unemployment, inflation will accelerate. So the monetarists assume that the number of transactions is constant at the natural rate of unemployment. Now, we have MV equals PT. We've talked about the various variables, the four of them. Now, if V and T are constants, that means that the change in M leads to a change in P. Delta M leads to a change in P. Delta P. Only if V and T are constants. Therefore, in order to control inflation, the government must control the growth of the money supply. Changes in P are caused by changes in M. M for the money supply. So if the government controls the money supply, it will control inflation. And that's how the Fisher equation suggests that inflation can be dealt with by controlling the money supply. Now the so-called high priest of monetarism, Milton Friedman, uh, who was a Nobel laureate, uh, well, oddly enough for his work in consumption theory, not so much in uh, monetarism. But according to Milton Friedman, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, it can be controlled only through adjustments in the money supply. There's only one type of inflation therefore, demand-pull. Sorry, demand-pull inflation. Um, it means that Trade unions can't put up uh, inflation. They, they can't influence inflation. If the trade unions negotiate for higher pay and the government does not increase the money supply, the trade unions will get higher pay, perhaps, from the employers, but then the, the customers will not have extra resources to buy the products at the higher price, so the companies will go out of business. So 
The trade unions have the capacity to make themselves redundant, but they have not got the capacity to influence the rate of inflation. So trade unions can't cause inflation. The inflation is not demand push. It's not pushed up by the trade unions. Inflation is demand pull. It's caused by the government. So only governments can cause inflation. Nobody else, according to this view. Now, Friedman's explanation for the money inflation connection. Well, we have delta M, the change in the money supply, leading to delta P, a change in the price level. But how does the relationship come about? Well, there's a so-called black box methodology. In other words, uh, it doesn't really matter how it comes about. The fact is, the figures show that the two are related. And in a sense, that's all we need to know. However, we're a curious uh, set of creatures, and we do want to know what's the mechanism. So we do actually want to know how it works. It's not just good enough to say the two seem to be related statistically and, and that's it. We want to know what what is the relationship. A portfolio explanation was offered by Friedman which suggests that we all have optimum portfolios of assets. We adjust our portfolio of assets over our lifetimes. So we have uh, later in life we have houses and cars and some money in the bank and uh, some furniture and a watch and some jewellery and so on. So we have the ideal portfolio. We've we've managed to accumulate this perhaps after years of working. In the early life people are constantly trying to acquire the portfolio. In later life they perhaps have achieved it. Now if the government increases the money supply and this works its way through the economy down to households, then the households will have too much money. Their portfolio will be upset. They had an ideal amount of money before, now they've got too much. So they will dispose of the extra by buying more assets to try and uh, return to an optimum portfolio of assets. So they will spend the excess cash but of course in spending the excess cash they're creating a demand for the goods and services which will push the price up. Now that's a possible explanation for the connection between the money supply and inflation. If the money supply increases individuals will wish to convert the excess into assets thereby pushing up the prices. Now the criticisms of Fisher equation, well we have delta M leads to delta P. A change in the money supply leads to a change in prices. Well delta M increases as a consequence of say delta V decreasing. So V is the velocity of circulation of money. Now if M increases and as a consequence V decreases for whatever reason so if M increases and V decreases then P will not be affected because we have on the one side MV equals PT so if M increases and V decreases they're on the, bo on the same side so nothing will happen on the other side P will not be affected Uh, it could be that M increases and as a consequence T increases. It could be the money supply increases, the number of transactions increase. Again, P may be unaffected. So we have all sorts of issues associated with the Fisher equation. It looks simple, but in fact there are several issues that need to be considered. And that's all we're going to deal with in this session. We've talked about some points related to monetarism, we've had an overview of monetarism and we've had an overview of the Fisher equation and how to control inflation. And that's all we're going to deal with in this video so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching.